would like to welcome our panel. Today on our panel, the first speaker will be Professor Asha Singh Kanwo. She's a world she's a worldist leading advocate of learning for sustainable development. She's the president and CEO of the Commonwealth of Learning. With over 35 years of experience, she has made outstanding contributions in the areas of teaching, research, and international development. We welcome you. We will also be joined by Dr. Kevin Frey, CEO of Generational Unlimited. As both an entrepreneur and an executive, Mr. Kevin, Dr. Kevin has spent his career at the nexus of the private and public sectors, spinning the education, technology, human capital, and international development spheres. We welcome you. The panel will also be joined by Mr. Will Straw, CEO of the Prince Trust International. He leads their role delivering education, employability, and enterprises, enterprise programs for young people in over 17 countries across the Commonwealth and beyond. The Prince Trust, worth to mention, the Prince Trust International was founded by His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, to tackle the global crisis in youth unemployment, building on four decades of experiences in the UK. We welcome you. Our panel will also be joined by Mrs. Uli Keita, Executive Director of Youth Connect Africa, an initiative of the government of Rwanda and the UNDP, based here in Kigali. She has over 17 years of wealth, of experience in expertise in the domains of international development, particularly in policy advocacy, work on women, youth employment and empowerment, governance, peace and security. Welcome. And lastly, to join our panel, an exciting young gentleman called Yusuf Mwadi. He is Rwandan, he's an entrepreneur with a passion for education and technology. He is the CEO and co-founder of Bag Innovation, a technology startup using uh, magnification and experimental learning to prepare students for jobs. You're all welcome. I'll start off with Professor Asha. Yes. From the perspective of the Commonwealth of Learning, what do the 21st century skills mean and what are the opportunities offered by distance learning to the youth acquiring those skills? Thank you for that question. Uh, but before I respond, let me introduce the audience to the Commonwealth of Learning. We are one of the three intergovernmental organizations of the Commonwealth, our job is to promote education and training using technologies. And we are not based in London, we are based in Vancouver, hosted by the government of Canada, which is why some of you may not have seen us before. Uh, from the point of view of the Commonwealth of Learning, let me also respond to what the Honorable Minister just said about four day working weeks, teamwork, and one day for reflection and well being. We are just implementing it already. So, Minister, we are on the right track. Uh, but the, I'll make three points quickly here. I've got three minutes, I understand. The first is that it's very significant that we are still talking about 21st century skills in the third decade of the 21st century. We've been talking about this since the 1990s. And what are these skills? And of course, everybody quotes McKinsey report and everybody talks about these skills in some form of, or the other. And the future of work, they say, will require four foundational skills, cognitive, interpersonal, self-leadership, and digital. And people with employable skills will be individuals, and all of you are here, the youth, who can add value beyond what can be done by automated systems, minister referred to empathy, who work efficiently in a digital environment and who can de demonstrate resilience to adapt to new ways of working and new occupations such as those that have been required during the pandemic. So my first point is that I think we've spoken enough about these 21st century skills. It's now time for action from commitment to action. 
My second point is about, you know, what are these future skills? The vice chancellor of the Open University of Mauritius carried out a survey of employers asking them what would be the skills required for uh, five years down the line for work. But because of the phenomenal changes in technology, the pandemic and global instability, they couldn't say what those uh, jobs would be. And estimates suggest that by the middle of this decade, 85 million jobs may disappear and 97 new million jobs will come up. So what are we going to do with all this confusion? And Robert Aoun proposes that we equip the youth with three literacies that will prepare them for this uncertainty. First, human literacy, which prepares students to perform jobs that only human beings can do. Human literacy will help them to make ethical choices, equip them for the social engagement through effective communications. The second literacy would be data literacy is essential in a world driven by data and learners must be able to find meaning in the flood of information around us and the fake news and all that kind of stuff that goes on. Third, technological literacy is essential if we are to understand machines and their uses. Learners must be able to deploy software and hardware in order to maximize their powers to achieve and create. So these are the three literacies, you know, that Robert Aoun referred to. Let me add a fourth, which is the climate literacy. Youth can be the champions to transform behaviors and promote environmental conservation among their peers, families, and communities. I remember when we were growing up and when we didn't want to listen to our parents, they said, we are your elders and betters. You better listen to us. Now we can say, these are the younger and wiser. Please listen to them in matters of climate change. So if we equip our learners with these four literacies, in fact, I would even say fluencies, we will be preparing them for the brave new world that lies ahead. So the second point I'm making is that we need to integrate these. We don't have to talk about them. We've got to integrate them at all levels in all disciplines in the curriculum. The third point, distance and online learning have the potential to foster these literacies and promote lifelong learning. Considering the many careers that individuals will change during their lifespan, distance and online learning provides a viable opportunity for skilling and reskilling at scale at a fraction of the costs. I'll give you an example of the Call Coursera Workforce Recovery Program, which we implemented during the pandemic to skill and reskill people for employment and reemployment, where over 150,000 Commonwealth citizens had free access. We provided them with free Coursera licenses to over 4,000 courses from some of the top universities in the world. The program was very popular among the 18 to 40 year olds, if you want to stretch the definition of youth, even though connectivity was often a challenge, learners use mobile devices or library facilities in what has been a life-changing experience. Call added value by establishing help desks to provide on-site academic and administrative support to learners. And this was usually done in collaboration with ministries of education. This was especially valuable for first-time online learners because many of them were located in very remote areas and the completion rates were very high at 40%. Normally MOOCs and online programs have completion rates of about 10 to 15%. This was 40% and above. So high success rates. And just to share with you an example, yesterday when we went for getting our badges from that accreditation center, uh, one of the volunteers, young person, uh, he says, oh, Commonwealth of Learning, thank you. Thank you for giving me the Coursera license. I've done 13 certificates I've earned over the last one year using that license. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to now apply to a university in Canada. Awesome. So there you go. And of course, courses in business, computing, etc., were very popular. And learners from Asia and the Caribbean were very interested in high tech IT courses, such as data sciences, computer sciences, IT services. 
Learners from Africa opted for courses in business development and entrepreneurship. In the Pacific, there was a high demand for vocational skills as well as accounting and self-development. And this is very interesting because there was a special demand for sports and recreation related courses in the Caribbean. So my third point is that during the pandemic, we've seen this huge momentum towards self-directed learning. So how do we build on this momentum to promote lifelong learning for all and build learning societies? Governments have a role instead of looking at, you know, uh, silos like primary, secondary, tertiary, let them look at the whole spectrum of lifelong learning. And for individuals and institutions, in, if, in fact, if institutions could recognize these qualifications, uh, we could have a kind of transformation in the way we develop skills for the future. Thank you very much, Professor Akan. That's very informative for all of us. Dr. Kevin. Generation Unlimited is, a champion, is championing a global movement of actors for youth, employment, and entrepreneurship. Could you please help us appreciate the scope of this global challenge and why partnership is key to addressing it? Sure. Uh, and I really appreciate it, actually, the last plenary, which talked a lot about partnerships. Yes. Um, the size of the problem is substantial. So 267 million young people globally right now mm -hmm. are not in employment, are not in education, are not in training. Um, of the lucky young people who are employed, 90% globally are actually working in the informal economy. So we're talking about unregulated, precarious work that often does not deliver a dignified livelihood. Layer on top of that, the twin transitions that we're seeing right now to the digital economy, to the green economies, and then finally, the gig economy. McKinsey is actually projecting that by 2027, 50% of all employment will be in the freelance or gig economy. So I think there's no question that some folks in the, in the audience, I'm sure, have heard of this description of the VUCA world that we're living in, this volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world, um, is, is very different than the one we're emerging from. So why Generation Unlimited, why partnership? And I think you know, the last session really got to the heart of this, but when you talk about skills and employment, when you talk about school to work, learning to earning transitions, governments can't solve this on their own. Private sector can't solve it on their own, and nor can young people. If you think about governments, they're, they're the supply side. They can deliver education and training at scale. But the question is, what kind of skills are they teaching? And I think we all know that many of these education systems are teaching skills for yesterday's economy, and we need to start teaching skills for tomorrow's economy. So who knows what those skills are? Well, that's the private sector. The private sector is doing the hiring. In some senses, they're the ones building the future. So we need the public sector to come together with the private sector and young people to be able to solve this global skills and employment challenge. And that's why Generation Unlimited, on a global level, we bring together heads of state, CEOs of some of the world's biggest organizations, young people, civil society players, to solve these problems together. Uh, we also do that at a country level. We're operating in 53 countries right now where we have governments working together with private sector and young people to try to tackle this challenge. Thank you. That's a great insight. Um, I'll go to Mrs. Keita. Um, speaking from the uh, perspective of the work that the Youth Connect Africa is doing to address um, the policies affecting youth, how can policy making be more adaptable and to enable nation, national and regional investments in skills development? Thank you, Ingrid, and good afternoon to you all. Um, skills development is definitely key if we are to ensure that young people have decent jobs and opportunities. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, if you look at the African continent, we are moving from an exporter mindset to becoming creators of raw materials, but also bringing our young people in the process. So skills development in the areas of agriculture, infrastructure, um, creative industry, manufacturing, you name it. We need to have sound policies for young people to be better placed in jobs for the 21st century. 
And I'll just give you three main policies that we can quickly act on. You have, first of all, the digital economy. COVID-19 has shown us that we can no longer ignore information technology, especially for young people. We need young people to develop the skills in data management, cybersecurity, um, computer engineering, or even social media management. To use social media, for example, as e-commerce, we have lots of young people who have actually used social media when we were all confined to do businesses. So digital economy is a policy that we should act on, one. The second one, as um, the CEO of Generation Unlimited alluded to, is the green economy. We know climate change is an issue. We see it, we live it every day. And so for Africa, the young people in Africa, we need to invest in things related to climate change, to soil fertility, to sustainable agriculture. We need to bring our young people to see the climate and agriculture as sexy, as something to be involved in for the future. The third one for me would be the service economy, because all of these things that I've just mentioned, you cannot actually accomplish any of these if the young people don't have the soft skills. They need to be able to communicate. In the previous session, someone was talking about the importance of communication. Young people need to be trained in communication skills, in interpersonal skills, in leadership skills, so that they can sell, they can trade, they can communicate, they can be better employees. So those three policy areas for me are important for us to look at right now. And this is why Youth Connect Africa has started this youth policy analysis work on the continent with partners um, of, you know, development partners, governments in Africa and the young people themselves. We are trying to look at policies for young people in this COVID recovery period. What can we do in terms of the three things, for example, that I've mentioned? What can we do to make sure that our young people are ready to tackle these emerging and changing world so that when another pandemic hits again, as His Excellency President Kagame mentioned, it's not a matter of time that we will have another pandemic. It's, is Africa ready to respond to another disaster like we had a couple of years ago? So those things for me are very important. And this is what Youth Connect Africa is endeavoring, working on youth policy analysis across the continent. Thank you very much, Madam Keita. And it's very true. Are we ready, really? Um, moving back to you, Will Strong. Um, the Prince Trust International, back into actually last year, in 2021, um, you conducted a research on the future of work. Could you please briefly tell us what key emerging observation from the research came out? Thanks, um, everyone, for, uh, for the, the session this afternoon. Um, Prince's Trust International delivers programs in uh, around um, 18 countries around the world, um, working with local partners. We work with 40 partners, delivering programs to keep young people engaged with their education, helping them find entry-level positions and uh, starting their own businesses as well. Um, understanding what young people need um, for the future of work is absolutely vital to our program development. So that's why we launched this research last year on the future of work. And on Thursday of this week, we'll be publishing an updated report surveying 10,000 young people from 10 countries, primarily uh, in the Commonwealth. And um, what we have found um, from this research, where we ask, what are young people's, um, what, what, how do they feel about the impact of COVID-19 mm -hmm. on their employment prospects? What are their hopes and aspirations for the future? And then what do they think government, business and civil society can do to support them? So on the pandemic, perhaps no surprise, but we found that about four in 10 young people have been affected with their uh, income or earnings have been affected. We found that a um, significant number of young people were not able to uh, return to work uh, or had to leave employment altogether. 
uh, and a staggering one in two felt their mental health was affected. So that is the backdrop when we think about the skills of the future. But there's some cause for optimism as well. Uh, and to the points that uh, other speakers have made, there is significant interest from young people in jobs in the green economy and in the digital economy and in the caring economy as well, as the demographics of the world lead to greater aging. And so there's more caring uh, needed. Um, we then asked um, what uh, young people wanted to see. And I might just see a show of hands here. Uh, how many of you in the audience think that education systems at the moment are providing young people with the skills for the world of work? Hands up if you think education systems are preparing young people for the world of work. And conversely, hands up if you think that education systems are not preparing young people for the world of work. Quite overwhelming. I mean, I think you are a more cynical bunch than those that we surveyed, but it was absolutely clear that young people's uh, primary desire was to see education system providing those skills. And what are those skills? We put a whole series of different skills to young people, and we found that it's those life skills, skills like self-confidence, communication, resilience, problem-solving, teamwork, that were even higher than ending school with a high school diploma or even a university education. Digital skills also uh, very high there. So we must do more to ensure that young people are leaving education. Uh, with those skills. But young people were also saying that the business community could do more to take a chance on young people, to provide more entry-level positions, to provide more internships that could lead to permanent employment. And then third, young people had a very significant interest in entrepreneurship. And I think that speaks to the point that Kevin was making. Uh, we know the demographics of many parts of the world, including Sub-Saharan Africa, are changing rapidly. Uh, in the Commonwealth, the majority uh, of the population are under the age of 25. And that means that jobs are gonna have to be created by the young people themselves, turning from job seekers to job creators. And that's a major part of, uh, of our research. Thank you very much, Mr. Well. You've just finished it well for Yusuf to take, the, to take on the floor. Tell us, Yusuf, the work that, ba that Bag Innovation is doing and really uh, at the intersection of education and employers also, what role has technology really enabled you to scale to the numbers of opportunities that you've been able to create for the young people? Yes. Um, yes. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so at Bag Innovation, what we do is we're essentially an ed tech um, a startup uh, based here in Kigali, Rwanda. We started about five years ago. And uh, essentially what we do is we basically work with employers to design work experience programs that actually give young people, job seekers, students, or graduates um, a taste of what it's like to actually work in a specific role at a specific company. And uh, what we're trying to achieve with that is we're trying to, um, for example, uh, I always tell this joke that in my office, I always receive a lot of students uh, and graduates who are about my age. And uh, they're always asking me about, hey, can I get a job? And uh, the first question that I asked them is, what can you do, mm -hmm. right? And uh, their answer is anything, right? And I'm like, okay, great. So um, I'm, I've been struggling with this financial model for our startup, can you do it please, right? And then it just becomes, um, uh, they just realize that uh, they really don't have those skills to actually get a job. And it's really our way to say, um, you, you know, you're trying to tackle the problem at the, at the wrong time. You know, young people, we need to realize that we need to start working on our career development from the first day in university, from the first day in high school. We need to realize that education is not going to prepare us uh, for the job uh, because millions of people have a degree, mm -hmm. right? And as an employer, you're not interested in looking at a lot of CVs. You're really interested in looking at who has something special on their CV. So basically what BAG does is we go to employers and we say, hey, uh, what are some of the roles that you're looking at hiring for in the next 10 uh, or even 12 months? give us a job description of all those roles. And with our learning designers, we design tasks and what we call experiences. So a student can go on our platform and they can select a sector of interest, so say mar uh, marketing. And uh, right away, we give them a lot of different companies that have posted uh, tasks that you would do if you were a marketing manager in that role. And your goal as a student is to take on that task and actually complete it. Uh, we give you a lot of uh, uh, guidance uh, throughout the steps. And uh, what we're trying to say is, hey, um, as soon as you complete that task, we, we could realize that, hey, you're only ready at 20% to work in a marketing role at this specific company. Would you like to actually improve this specific skill? 
And therefore, we create learning experiences that actually take them through uh, that experience so they can come back and take those tasks. And also at the same time, uh, one thing that I have to mention, this is also a perfect way for a lot of young people to be able to build a portfolio of skills. Um, so one, one, of, uh, one of the simplest way that we like to describe BAG is for all the tech guys here is if you take GitHub and uh, you uh, basically incorporate it with Coursera. So you're basically helping a young person say, I'm going to do this task, I'm gonna fail and I'm gonna learn and I'm gonna come back and do it again. So by the time they go to the job interview and um, an employer asks them, how many years of experience do you have uh, for an entry level job? Uh, they're able to answer and say, I haven't been fortunate enough to get an internship because there are not that many, uh, but I've been on the back platform for the last six to 12 months where I've been completing real tasks and you can see my profile and mm -hmm. my, uh, all the proof of actual work. So you can take a better decision to hire me. Um, yeah, so that's essentially what BAG does. That's quite impressive. Um, we've been hearing all about employability and, uh, and the issue of, uh, of skills. But now I think in the audience, we have a couple of youth who would like to make some intersections. So please take note of your questions and we will do just one more round of questions and then jump on to you. You can ask all your questions. Dr. Professor Asher, quick question. We've spoken about the role of the youth. Yusuf just mentioned it. We've spoken about the policies, the government. We, we also spoke about partners. Now, please tell us real quick, what's the main challenge that should be really addressed to make sure that, they are, that the young people are really, have, really do have access to these uh, 21st century skills? Just one main challenge. Okay. One major issue, let me share an example of what we are doing for girls. And these are the most marginalized girls in the remotest regions in 10 countries. It's called Girls Inspire. And it's a kind of holistic program where we are teaching them technical skills, whether it's mobile repairs, carpentry, um, sewing, baking, whatever. Uh, we teach them life skills as part of this program. And we teach them financial literacy. So it's a kind of package of three types of skills to prepare them for livelihoods. And these are young girls who are in great danger of, you know, child early and forced marriage. But because when they start, when they achieve all these skills uh, and contribute to the family economy, then there's a greater likelihood of them not getting married off at 14 or 12 or whatever. So one of the lessons which we've learned from this program is that it's not enough to give them uh, training. You've got to provide them opportunities for either employment or entrepreneurship. So what we do is link them while they're in training with employers associations where they get, you know, the opportunity of start starting level jobs or with financial institutions where they get small seed money to start their own little business. So I think that is a very important thing that train uh, youth, but also, you know, take them to the very end by providing with the opportunities. Perfect. Thank you. And for you, Dr. Kevin, how can we ensure quality education is offered to all? Uh, thank you. Um, I'll probably make three points here. One, I think teachers have to be the center of education. Uh, and that means providing quality pre-service and in-service teacher training and making sure we're paying wages that are attracting talented individuals into the teaching profession. Um, secondly, connectivity. Uh, I think, I deeply believe as an ed tech entrepreneur myself, uh, that opportunity sits at the end of an internet connection. Uh, those are opportunities for world-class skilling and certification. On the internet, you actually have access to some of the best professors and institutions around the world, and you can be certified by them. Um, you can also connect to jobs. You can get jobs of working across borders. So I think that, that governments need to prioritize driving connectivity in order to provide quality education. I know UNICEF here through the GIGA program is also helping to connect schools to the internet. I think it's so, so, so important. Um, and then finally, uh, looping back to my uh, original point, I think getting focused on those future skills, almost everyone has talked about entrepreneurial mindsets and skills as a skill for the future. Um, I'll give just one short anecdote as, as kind of my final remark here. I was in Delhi um, six months ago. The government of Delhi, and, and full, full credit to them, has decided to make an entrepreneurial mindset curriculum. Every single student in Delhi gets entrepreneurial training from grade 9 to grade 12, five days a week. Wow. 
It's the most popular course. It's not evaluated. And young people go through this. And at the end, they actually get seed money from the government to start companies. I remember I was in one of the classrooms and I asked this young 16-year-old girl after she presented this amazing sustainable enterprise idea she had. And I asked that ridiculous question that I got to stop asking um, that the old person asks to the young person. And I said, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, and I figured she was going to say, because of course we were in India, she was going to say a civil servant or a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer. Mm -hmm. And she answered it, and I'll never forget what she said to me. She said, well, sir, I don't want to be a job seeker. I want to be a job creator. Oh, wow. And that was just stunning to me. And I really do believe that when educational systems get their mind around the power of entrepreneurship and start to teach these skills, we can really change the game for young people. Thank you. We should all be job creators. <laughs> um, Mr. Will, what are the opportunities for strengthening um, the creativity around schools, education, but also at a reasonable cost? So I want to answer this question by talking about a programme that the Prince's Trust has developed over many years. This is our Achieve programme, which was uh, launched in the UK decades ago and now has the uh, equivalence of a GCSE, which is our qualification for 16-year-olds. Um, and what's so special about Achieve is it's a modular programme that brings an engaging approach to education for young people who are marginalised, or at risk of dropping out of the education system. And through Prince's Trust International, we now operate this program in a number of countries. And uh, where we do that, what we've found is that our local providers can adapt the program uh, so it works for the local context, dialing up one module or another. So might maybe doing more on digital skills, more on climate literacy, more on um, skills for future employment, and so on. But secondly, to Kevin's point, we found that the teachers give us fantastic feedback about the training of trainers, the training of the teachers that takes place to prepare them for the classroom delivery. So I was in Ghana just a couple of weeks ago uh, at a school in a deprived part of Accra uh, with the um, local providers, Junior Achievement Ghana, uh, and the teachers at the school and, and sat through uh, an hour's uh, module. Um, the young people who had been handpicked because they were struggling with their attendance or their behaviour were incredibly engaged in the programme. And the teachers said it was the first time they'd really had an opportunity to focus on their own teaching skills since they first entered the classroom. Uh, it needn't be expensive, uh, so long as the schools or the, the government are willing to uh, use the teacher's time. Um, all you need to do is have that training of trainers and prepare the modules at the start, and then it's eminently scalable. So what we're now seeking to do is to scale that programme. We've launched it here in Rwanda uh, in the last year, um, working with Akazai Kanozi Access uh, through youth clubs rather than schools, but to the same audience. And we think that's a great way that you can do that. I'm sure there are many other initiatives, but better for me to speak from our own experience. Thank you. And uh, Madame Keita, how can the Commonwealth countries really work coll collaboratively to strengthen youth-focused policies for the 21st century jobs? Thank you, Ingrid. We believe that um, there's nothing you can do alone, so you have to bring all the stakeholders at the table. So at Youth Connect Africa, we have what we call the 5P model, which is the first P is policy, so all the policy makers. The second P is politics, so working with politicians and decision makers, governments. The third P is popular mobilization, bringing the young people around the youth agenda themselves. The fourth P is pop culture, using artists, singers, influencers to communicate with young people in the language that they understand. And the fifth one is partnership. So using the 5P model, we work all together with all the stakeholders to empower, to educate, and to bring employment slash entrepreneurship opportunities to young people, and we call that the triple E agenda. And we believe that is the only way to actually harness the, the demographic dividend. And so I think countries in the Commonwealth, the 54 member states have to really tap into that 1.8 billion brains to educate, to empower, and to bring in employment opportunities or entrepreneurship. That is the way to really tap into jobs 
for young people in the 21st century. There's no other way around it. We just have to get it done. Thank you. And lastly, Mr. Yusuf, tell me, um, part of the lessons that you're learning in the work that you're doing, what would be um, inspired new approaches in creating jobs, but also how is, would your model be scalable to other, to other partners? Yes, uh, thank you very much. So uh, one of the uh, key learnings that we've, um, we, we've had with BAG is that we've come to realize that with ad tech, uh, retention is uh, one, of the, one of the most painful things that any founder can do uh, because right now the average retention for ad tech uh, platforms is around 20%. So if you have a million signups, you only get 200,000 people who will be using the product on a, on a daily basis. Um, so what we've done is, um, which is super cool and we're super grateful for this, is we've, um, we've managed to get um, our, one of our angel investors is um, one of the guys who basically was leading the team that built Candy Crush. So what we've done is we've looked at our platform and we've said, okay, how do we actually integrate gamification to our platform uh, so we can uh, really retain a lot of young people so they can see that learning is fun and it's not really, uh, you know, because there is so many courses out there, like how do you know which ones to take? Um, so what we're doing is that we're integrating gamification on our platform where uh, for every single action that um, uh, a user takes, uh, they're receiving different rewards. And these rewards can go up to um, something that is in line with our career development. So for example, it could be, um, uh, you know, partnering with a telco where uh, if you reach a certain level, you're able to receive uh, free 50% uh, off on your monthly airtime so you can access uh, technology better. Uh, but also different other uh, fun things uh, that we can get. So for example, you can, uh, on your favorite, uh, you know, e-grocery store, you're able to get a, a discount on something that you buy because uh, you're a bag user. So by doing that, we're really integrating into the life of the learner and they're feeling like, uh, this is something I should be doing on a daily basis, right? And um, in that process, we are actually achieving what we want to achieve, which is uh, those behaviors that we want to see, that um, the behavior change that we want to see that is built through habits. So we believe that gamification is really the future of ad techs, and uh, we really want to uh, pioneer that and in Rwanda specifically, and also scale that um, all over the country. And maybe on the question around uh, scalability, um, when we started BAG, it was a fully offline model. Uh, students were coming into our office, but then we realized that uh, we couldn't, uh, you know, fit 50 plus people into our small office. So what we did was um, a lot of them said, hey, can I do it when I'm in the village? I don't need to come to your office. And uh, we basically built our platform based on that. And uh, one other small exciting thing is um, we partnered with Viamo, uh, which is basically um, an organization that helps uh, different companies to be able to uh, develop mobile uh, solutions so they can access more people. So what we've done is we've recorded a lot of content in Kenya Rwanda uh, around career development. So how do you get a job? How, where do you find a job? How do you build a CV? What are the key centers on a CV? All of that in Kenya Rwanda that young people all over Rwanda can access. And so far we've been able to reach over 90,000 unique uh, users in just six months. Wow. So that's, um, you know, it just shows that if you're really building with, um, uh, you know, with a scaling mindset, uh, you know, there's a lot of good technologies that are already there. It's just how do we partner and uh, get this to a lot of people. Thank you very much. Quite inspiring. Um, allow me now to turn to the audience. Uh, we could receive some questions. Um, we have some ushers with microphones around the room. Please uh, put your hands up, state your name and uh, where you're coming from and uh, try and make it a bit brief. Thank you. On this, uh, on the left side. On that side. Yeah, hello. Um, my name is Usman Ture from The Gambia. Um, Ambassador of the University of the Gambia and um, founder and CEO of Young Ancestors Foundation. So this is not basically a question, but just um, a quick comment from the discussions. Uh, thank you so much for um, highlighting the fact that there is something wrong with the education system, especially when it comes to the curriculums and what young people are learning in higher institutions and the kind of uh, problems that awaits us in the society. There is a bit of a disconnection, and especially in this, 
we have to hit hard on the curriculums. That is exactly what are we studying in the um, tertiary institutions. Um, I believe that universities and tertiary institutions should be solution centers where the society should reach out for directions where uh, there is need. But what we see today is um, we ended up having more problems going to school because we ended up graduating and not even having ideas on how we can contribute to solving societal problems. And again, um, in moments like this, I, I do recommend that we can also have a moment where young people will not just be in a room to say ideas, but some great initiatives have been talked about in this city of Kigali. How do we go in to those spaces and see exactly what they are doing beyond the room here, which will also serve as an inspiration and most of us can go back to act upon those bases. Another thing is as well, um, we need skill set, but mindset is another thing, and that is the most relevant thing. Most of the young people here have already developed amazing projects, but do we really have the space to really make these projects or those initiatives work? So for those individuals that are in a higher positions as top entrepreneurs or has developed key uh, or amazing stuff, should really look into um, inviting these young folks in their own space to not only mentor them, but guide them through um, on how they can scale up their businesses, but as well as how they can um, take those ideas to transform other communities as they are doing in their respective countries. Thank, Thank you, you so very much, Osman. That's very great. Youth, you're invited to visit Kigali and uh, learn from many enterprises and uh, companies that you meet. Uh, there's another lady, um, on the left one. Um, thank you. My name is Eden Gatesi and I'm from Rwanda. So um, I had a question from your experience. Uh, what, what, what have you faced at, at the job that you felt like this challenge is as a result of a gap, a sudden gap in the education system? And what do you think can be integrated into the education system so as to make sure that the current young people who are uh, graduating are not going to face the same challenge when they reach into the uh, job market? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in the middle, there's a lady. Thank you. So, uh, once again, my name is Victor from Camera. So, um, I just want to ask to our uh, yes, speakers. Are they offering like opportunities to work with um, youth-led initiatives in rural areas in the, the different countries? Thank you. Um, in, on this side, on the left side. Hi everyone. I'm Martha Naukenge from Uganda. I work with EcoBricks, a recycling company. We believe in zero waste communities. My question, sorry, I'll talk the way it is, then we can polish it up. We are talking about being job creators, but at the end of the day, we as the youth, we have a challenge. Much as we want to create our own jobs, sometimes we are irrelevant. And how can you help us to polish us in the right path? Then we go back to the issue where Madame Olivia talked about, Oli, sorry, where he talked about social media. We are the youth, we are using social media the wrong way. Uh, how can we use it in our development? Because at the end of the day, we want to cope up with the trend but different apps are not user-friendly. Then we as the youth who want to create our own market via social media, but our own hashtags are never promoted because there, there are other voices on social media that are against our own development. How can we raise our voices through all that storm? Because we the youth, we are the future, we are the vision. But sometimes on social media, we are blocked. How can we pass through that barrier? Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, the last, last question at the back, a gentleman. Uh, 
Uh, hello, uh, my name is Chimman Alexandre. I'm a founder and managing director of Sunwing. We do avocado processing towards and cosmetics. Uh, we are based in the northern province of Rwanda. And uh, my question goes to all the panelists, but especially to Yusuf. Uh, Yusuf, you work with students, and the, of course, there are so many solutions that can literally solve current uh, challenges that the young people face. But as she has said, the bias on the media and also uh, the, the information flow is still uh, st static. What is your advice on media? Because we also have a very lag behind about the information flow. Why can't we have a, a TV or a channel? There is a tw uh, France 24, there is BBC, but why is it that, that Commonwealth doesn't have a TV? where the young people can have their programs that facilitate the common wealth. Why? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll stop with the questions and come back to the panel. Um, I think we'll start with you, Yusuf. Um, since uh, you'll probably be the one who's just recently graduated, so when you went into your workplace, what challenges did you see that made you realize that you're not well equipped when you left school? Also, tap into the question the gentleman just asked. Thank you. Yes. Um, thanks. Uh, actually, fun fact is that um, I started uh, started back uh, when I graduated, um, when I was in my gap year after high school. So um, I actually quickly realized this, that problem, uh, which was, okay, um, why go to university when a lot of people who are graduates are already uh, crying, if I can say, that they're not being able to get jobs? Um, so why go and spend all that money? So Basically, my co-founder and I decided to tackle that problem right away. And um, ever since, it's always been a big challenge where a lot of people have always asked me, oh, why don't you go to university? But I told them, uh, why do I need to go to university? Um, and um, I've been, eventually I went um, uh, later. So one of the biggest challenges, uh, I would say from the perspective of BAG, is really the problem-solving skills. And uh, problem-solving is really broad. It can be critical thinking, it could be taking initiative. And um, it's one of the biggest things that when you, when you look at what does an employer really want from an employee? They want someone who can really think for themselves and they're not going to need them when, uh, uh, you know, there's water everywhere, the office is flooded and the employee is calling the employer saying, what do we do? It's like, I'm an employer, but I'm like, I don't know what to do as well. So I want you to come up to, uh, to me with, a, with an actual um, solution to, to the problem. So... And um, yeah, that can go into problem solving. And what, uh, what we try to do with BAG is we really try to expose people to a lot of different challenges, which is like, this is the, these are the things that you are going to face if you are working in a role. These are the things you're going to face. So it's important that you start training yourself on how to actually solve them. Um, so that by the time you are faced with that problem on the job, or even when you're creating a business, um, you know what are some of the steps to actually take uh, for you to solve that problem. So. I would encourage anyone uh, who's here who hasn't uh, registered, go and register on BAG. It's bag.work. And, uh, you know, we'd love to hear your feedback. We would love to hear, um, you know, your ideas on how we can make the content better. And uh, really just go and play around with the app. It's free for now. Uh, so I'm just giving you that clue. Keep it free. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Kevin, do you get to rural areas in... Do you do do you do work in the rural areas and partner with some of the? Would you partner with some of the young people? Yeah, we work in fifty four countries right now, and obviously uh, a huge portion of our programs are in rural areas. Uh, I mentioned the statistic about NEET, so uh, young people not in employment education or training. Many of those are in rural areas, so we do a lot of work there. Of course, we're always looking for partners, and we're always working through local partners. Uh, no question about that. Um, awesome. So you have a partner. Yeah, <laughs> um, Straw, um, how do we polish young people? I was actually going to look at the rural question oh, as well, okay. if you don't mind. Please do. Um, we have a program called Enterprise Challenge, um, which is also targeted at um, school aged children, uh, helping them to get the entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, and it's, um, it's taught through an online simulation game uh, in, in the classroom. And then local business mentors are brought in to help the young people develop a business idea 
which then competes in a national finals. Uh, and uh, we're going to be demonstrating this tomorrow to give a little plug at our, one of the capacity building sessions tomorrow at nine o'clock. So any delegates in the room will have an opportunity to uh, test that out. And I think that is a way of helping people, young people polish their entrepreneurial skills, but it's also something that we've offered in rural communities. Mm -hmm. So in Kenya, it's, we've targeted it in rural communities. And during the pandemic, there was one individual in particular, a young woman called Ekaleli Susan, who went on to win the Prince's Trust Global Award because she found her family in a really desperate situation when her mother lost her cleaning job and her father lost his job as well. Uh, she persuaded them to turn the idea that she developed through our Enterprise Challenge game uh, into a proper business. The family put their savings worth about $50 into the business and set up a local food stall, which went on to employ everybody in the family, including some neighbors, mm -hmm. uh, and has doubled the family's income. And we brought her over to London recently for our Princess Trust Awards. And she's an inspiration to all of us. And I think a great example of how these programs that uh, you can't always be certain what the impact is, is having a profound impact. And we're hoping that we'll be able to roll that out in many more countries, including again in Rwanda, where we'll be launching it later this year. Thank you. Rendezvous tomorrow, 9 a.m. Perfect. Um, just as we close, Professor Asher, what will be your last word to the, to the audience? question about what are the biggest challenges in education going forward. And I think for the young people, one of the big challenges is that we keep talking about transforming education, but we are not ready to give away with, do away with the SAT scores and other things, you know. And unless we get rid of those kinds of requirements, there won't be any kind of transformation because people will still have to do this kind of road studying to try to get those scores to get into the universities. And the second uh, big challenge for young people is that many countries do not accredit your degrees. For example, in Canada, they say, if you have to have a heart attack, it's better to have it in a taxi because it's your taxi driver's probably a heart surgeon because they don't recognize those degrees in different countries. So I think we need more of accreditation. Young people are very mobile. They go from one country to another but their qualifications will not be recognized. So I think that's one of the big challenges of education. Thank you. How about you? One final comment answering the, the question about young people wanting to be job creators. Um, and I think it's unfair for us and, and societies at large to kind of put the onus on young people to become job creators, like you said. There's an entire ecosystem around young people that needs to be activated in order for young people to be entrepreneurs. And that means governments and policy have to take this into account. Not only do you need that entrepreneurial mindset training through education systems, you also need a policy environment that allows you to open companies quickly. It doesn't take six months or a year to get the paperwork. And then you need access to finance. And there's lots of ways to do this, but you need an ecosystem around young people to empower them to become job creators. So thank you so much for that question. And just kind of underscoring the fact that young people can't do this on their own. And it's our job, everyone here on the stage and the government to create the ecosystem so that young people can become job creators. Thank you. How about you, Mr. Mr. Will? What will be your closing remark? Sorry, on your closing remarks. Yeah, well, um, I think what we've highlighted today is that the, um, the skill system right around the Commonwealth, uh, regardless of the country, is not fit for purpose. Um, we're facing a um, economic crisis with the World Bank and others talking about an era of stagflation. We have the mental health hangover from the pandemic. And of course, we're facing a climate crisis as well, which is going to disrupt many, many communities. So it's absolutely essential that we all work together, uh, government, business, and civil society, to ensure that the skills that young people gain help them to address some of these challenges. Mm -hmm. And we know from our research that young people are optimistic about the future. They believe they're going to earn more than their parents. They believe that they can address some of the challenges. Mm -hmm. And it's incumbent on all of us that those uh, optimism and opportunities are not dashed and that we make sure that we come together and ensure that the 21st century is a century where everyone can fulfill their true potential. Thank you very much. Madame Oli? 
Yes, before I come to the closing um, remarks, someone from Uganda, a, a lady from Uganda has asked me about the social media, the use of social media by young people. Um, I'd like to say that in Africa in general, unfortunately, many of our young people are using the social media wrongly. I mean, social media is supposed to be an opportunity. It's supposed to be a tool that you use to improve whatever you're doing. But some of our young people are really using social media for other things that are not, uh, that are detrimental to them mentally, physically. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, please, you talked about your hashtags uh, not being promoted, for example. There are millions of young Africans who are doing wonderful things on social media with good hashtags who are being promoted. So learn from those. Don't go on social media to promote yourself, how you live, how many houses you have. Use social media to promote your business. Use social media to improve your skills. There are tons of data out there, free for young people to use. So use it the right way to benefit from it and not the contrary. So for my closing remarks, I would say resilient youth, resilient commonwealth, so please invest in the youth. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and Yusuf, what will be your closing remark? Yes, um, I, I would like to direct it to, uh, to employers in the house. So if we have any employers, uh, please ease those job descriptions, at least for entry level jobs. So more people can get the opportunities. Uh, um, and uh, yes, I definitely do agree with uh, grit and resilience. Uh, a job is not going to come and find you. This is one of the biggest problems that we have on the continent. And uh, you're not going to sit at home and watch Netflix and accept, uh, expect uh, uh, an internship or a job to, to, to you know, land uh, on your lap. So you have to go and get it. You have to uh, find any of the CEOs around and say, hey, can I intern? Can I volunteer? I need to build my skills. And it's going to be painful, but it's really going to reward um, in, in the future. Thank so. you. Nothing is ever worth it that is very comfortable. All right. On that note, uh, we thank you very much, dear panelists. Uh, and it's been a great pleasure to host you. Have a great evening.